today we will talk to you about expanding your practice with Apple Health something where all of us if we work together can make a tremendous difference in the lives of many across the state of Washington so I've just been practicing for you you've just been winging it it's all on YouTube. Dental practice. That's what they call it. one of the things that we take pride in the most in our profession is the bond that we have with our patients that we connect with our patients and we are very proud of the fact that we build a relationship with the patient that's going to improve their health. That's why we chose this profession. With the expansion of Apple Health as a result of the Affordable Care Act, there are many more patients out there who are now eligible to receive dental care who weren't previously. We do have a different face of the patient coming into the office. These folks now are often called the working poor perhaps, or even lower middle income folks. They have uh, the ability to maybe just be in this program for a while, and then perhaps become private practice um, patients and have their own individual insurance plans or company plans. Apple Health patients are all around us. They're all types of people all over the state. It's not the same as it was in the past. Access has two parts. It has a supply part and a demand part. So there's a larger supply of patients. The demand has gone up as a result of that, but there are the same number of providers out there. So we need to get those providers out there who may not have seen Apple Health patients to see those patients. The reason we need to do that is they have dental health needs. They have oral health needs. Many patients get episodic care. They have an emergency, they have a toothache, or they haven't had their teeth cleaned in a while and they're feeling like they need to get it done and they go in and seek episodic care or perhaps a practice only provides episodic care, that's not the best for anybody, especially the patient. I think any dental professional wants to, to make their patients comfortable and uh, get on a preventive track to kind of avoid future problems. Bring the patient into our practice, create a dental home, they will be a grateful patient forever, and we'll be able to provide what we ultimately want to provide, which is a state of health in the mouth and therefore in the rest of the body. So some of the perceptions of the Apple Health Plan are based upon the way it was operated in the past. It was very cumbersome perhaps, filing claims was very difficult. People said, well I took on some of the patients but I didn't even file the claims, because it was just too difficult. That is just not the case today. It does take some initial learning but it's pretty quick and people are willing to help. Once you've learned the system, you get paid faster than almost any other plan. And while dentists are fighting for improving the plan, making it better, making the reimbursements better. We still have an obligation to take care of patients who present to us. Taking on patients who are covered by Apple Health really fulfills one of the main things that people want when they go into the profession. I want to help people. There's no other way that I can think of that's better at helping people than bringing on those who need it the most and bringing them into your practice. There's a changing source of dental financing in the United States as seen by this chart depicting dental expenditures by source of financing. This comes from CMS or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and also includes Medicare, Medicaid and CHIP. So here, here you can see going back to 1990 and then up to 2013 the most recent data that the out-of-pocket expenditures and the um, private insurance expenditures have roughly stayed the same. In fact, out-of-pocket dropped off from 1990 to 95 and has stayed about the same, but remarkably, the expenditures from the government, CMS programs, as mentioned, Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, have more than doubled since 1995 and quadrupled since 1990. So the amount of money, although the smallest portion of the total, has gone up the most in that area, and it's expected as reported by the American Dental Association and many other organizations that the public expenditure for dentistry will be the area, the single area, that will continue to grow over the decade and decades ahead. So given that there is increase in dental coverage through public programs, how can we all take advantage of this opportunity? How can we take advantage of this opportunity? Well, there's a capacity to treat more patients. This shows the percentage of general practitioners in dentistry who have declared that they're not busy enough. This is from the 
American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute where a survey is conducted usually each year. This one was taken in 2014 looking back to 2013 and we have data going back to 2007. So in 2007 20 percent of dentists said they weren't busy enough and then it, it went up a lot of course with the economic downturn and peaked in 2011 but we're still about the same at 36 percent of general practitioners saying they're not as busy as they'd like to be. And as a result not every chair is fully utilized. The average wait time for initial appointments and days and again the same kind of uh, data accumulation from this survey and this shows the comparison of patients of record versus new patients and let's look at the dotted line on top this being new patients and we can see that the average wait time back in 2001 was more than 10 days 11 or 12 days and now it's dropped below six days and five days for a patient of record so I think this is something that we all would like to see improved but given this it's important to note that there's there's capacity there's opportunity in our empty chairs Washington Apple Health dental enrollment is also on the rise given Medicaid expansion which took place several years ago prior to the Medicaid expansion in 2010 there were 470,000 adults on Medicaid in the state of Washington in 2014 that number had almost doubled to 853,000 so I'll be going through and talking about some myths and realities about Apple Health, our state's Medicaid program. Myth that most Apple Health patients are disabled and unemployed. Well that is not true at all. The new population includes many low-wage workers and young adults getting an education. In fact, many of our own dental students when they reach the age, the age of 26 and therefore can no longer be on their parents dental insurance plan or medical insurance plan are now in Medicaid. So we have several, I should say many, dental students on Apple Health. Today's Apple Health population are the working poor. It now covers adults making 16000 annually, 27000 for a family of three, hence uh, dental assistants and other health care providers are often covered on Apple Health. Restaurant and food service workers, retail store employees, child care providers, and students, as noted, and recent college graduates, including dental and medical students. More providers are needed to meet the demand with the number of enrolled participants in the neighborhood of 900,000 in the state. And with no increase in providers, the utilization is decreasing in 2010 we had nearly 30 percent utilization and now we're down to 23 percent. It's clear that we all have to pitch in do our part in order to make this program work. So can I afford, can we afford to serve Apple Health patients? Yes if your chairs aren't full. It's incremental revenue. Once the chairs are full then it does cannibalize other income potentially. But if the chairs aren't full and we all take a small part then we can make a big difference. So look at your schedule, at the monthly schedule, identify time slots when chairs tend to be empty. And it is possible, and it is allowed, and it is encouraged to use those times to take advantage of the empty chairs and fill them with patients on Apple Health. Calculate the cost. It's a foregone revenue for an hour of an empty chair. So an empty chair, like an empty seat on an airplane, is uh, once the plane leaves, the chair, the seat's empty. Once the day's gone, the chair was empty. We want to fill those chairs to maximize the revenue given the opportunity. For example, there are fixed costs in offices, obviously, and for practice collects half a million a year or 42,000 a month. With a 60% overhead, let's say, then that's 25,000 net monthly expenses. The office is open 16 days a month, eight hours a day, 128 hours a month then it's about $195 per hour fixed cost. So with four chairs, the hourly fixed cost per chair is about $49 in this particular example. 
So you can use Apple Health to fill the lulls. So by let's let's talk about the fees in a minute. These these are examples of fees on Apple Health, and obviously they're lower than our fees, our our usual and customary fees. But let's talk about the empty chairs here. So one patient, a working mom who needs some perio maintenance, some periodic evaluation, some bite wing radiographs. Uh, the revenue there would be 74.52 after supply, 64.52. Then you can see these other examples of an older adult, um, an example of a three surface composite filling. Um, these are just examples, but you can see the incremental revenue just by taking a few patients utilizing the opportunity available in the empty chairs in the office. 20 empty chairs, chair hours per month now filled by Apple Health patients. And this is just an example, patients from different categories. Comes out to, as you can see the calculation, almost $2,000 a month or almost $23,000 a year of incremental revenue. Now that's not gigantic relative to a $500,000 practice, but it's definitely an, a significant and noteworthy increment relative to empty chairs where the costs are sunk anyway. And I should also note that if, if all of us take a few patients not an overwhelming number, where it may be challenging, but a few patients, then collectively we can make a tremendous difference in the hundreds of thousands of patients across the state who have Apple Health as their dental coverage and now can get access by virtue of much more participation across the board. So let's debunk some other myths. This won't benefit my practice. Well, reality is, as noted a moment ago, you can see financial and personal benefits, although small and incremental, they are better than having empty chairs. And if you want to expand the practice, it's a great way to try to remain full whenever possible. Many people don't stay on Apple Health. In fact, most don't. They get their feet on the ground, they pay cash or get insurance, they remain loyal to your practice. Imagine a patient that you took in who later has dental insurance or has the means to pay beyond dental insurance, they will be grateful forever in terms of what you can do for them. Incorporating Apple Health clients into your practice. <coughs> um, examine practice management business approaches. Involve the whole team. It's essential that the entire team be on board and that if we're going to take a few patients into our practice, all of us, that the team can together build a case and discuss how a full office capacity brings an opportunity that's beneficial to everybody in the practice. Scheduling policies, well, uh, create a formal written policy, outline all aspects of scheduling, including how far in advance to make the appointments, number of treatments per visit, how to handle appointment reminders, how to respond to patient no-shows. Now this is obviously not different than the policy you already have for patients in general, but it is essential that since you're taking incremental patients in Apple Health who are beneficial to the practice and certainly to the patient, that the rules of the practice be reinforced throughout, uh, before, during, and uh, at recare visits. In order to reduce missed appointments, there have been many practices deployed that have been very effective. There are so many best practices out there, including at the initial visit, have patients sign the scheduling policy agreement. Schedule appointments no more than 30 days out and ask what form of communication the patients prefer. Contact the patients 48 hours before their appointment and have them confirm within 24 hours. Have a call list ready when appointments are unconfirmed or canceled. Now these are principles that many of you may already do for all of your patients. I think they are particularly important when adding incremental patients so that we can maximize the value and the impact of having Apple Health patients into your practice. Another myth, if you accept Apple Health, you need to take anyone who calls. That's absolutely not true. You can determine how many patients to take, and you have flexibility to start and stop taking clients depending on your other practice demands. You can determine when during the week, how many each day, and this can change whenever you decide to change it. That's why it's essential that everybody participate, take a few patients, and start off with, if you haven't been an Apple Health provider, start off with a few, 
see how this is working using some of the principles here and talking to others who've made it work very well. There are so many best practices out there. And then add to that increment to the extent one can, given the busyness of their practice. You can limit, start small, maybe a few patients each week or month, decrease or increase as your practice changes, and seek referrals from medical practitioners in the community. Most medical practitioners accept Apple Health patients. This will be a practice builder when the medical colleagues realize that you, along with the dental community, are participating in the program. Look at a program in Colorado that the Colorado Dental Association has supported called Take Five. Everybody take five patients into their practice each month. And if we all did that, we would make a tremendous dent into this problem and provide care to so many, to hundreds of thousands of patients across the state who desperately need our help through access to care through the Apple Health program. Next visit, what I'm hoping to do is take care of the upper right part of back one and the two down here. And then basically you're done. Nice part about Tacoma is we're multi-generational. Okay. Um, because it's so blue collar, we get to see families, four generations of families, um, so they stay with me. And I th actually, that's one of, probably one of the coolest things about dentistry for me is we, I've seen the grandparents, their kids, their kids, and now their kids are bringing in their kids. I've seen these little guys since they've been this tall. Dr. Katashima and his staff are awesome. I found out about him through my parents, and they had nothing but good things to say, and as soon as I came in, it's like, oh, I get it. He has a light touch, he's gentle, makes you feel comfortable. My son comes here, he's six, and uh, he has no fear of the dentist, so that's a good sign. Right now I'm doing landscaping, and then I also do styling assistant for photo shoots, and I'm gonna start school back up in the fall. As my practice grew, I just sort of made a commitment that I was always going to keep a percentage of my patients with, with Apple Health. In medicine, I would lay good odds that just about every single general medical doctor is seeing people under Apple Health. Dentistry needs to step up to bat too. It's taken stress off of me to know I have the ability to, if I have a need, I can go and I can be seen and I can get the help I need. We've got multiple problems right now. Um, in the, la the economy took a hit, um, uh, reimbursement uh, took a hit, and so my practice included, we took a huge hit here. And, uh, but, you know, there's still that population out there. And they, they're sitting out there having to be treated, so you just do what you can. Usually your first visit with an Apple Health patient is an emergency visit. So we'll bring them in, and usually, of course, they want to continue with us. If we've got the opening, I tell them right up front, you will never miss an appointment with me. You miss one appointment with me, one, and we're done. And uh, because there's, frankly, a hundred other adults out there right now who need your spot. The care that I've received, you know, insurance, no insurance, Apple Care is the same across the board, it's consistent. I get, you know, six every six months I get my teeth cleaned and I get x-rays -ray, x taken care of. Um, and when there's a need that Dr. Katashima sees, I know that he's not gonna put me in a position to where I can't get that taken care of. I challenge anybody to point out somebody in our waiting room that they're Apple Care or not. I mean, you know, it's a, um, a lot of, uh, I noticed that the people under Apple Care who have been seeing us, they've just hit a hard spot. Some of them hit a hard spot, and um, uh, I don't mind trying to help them out a little bit in my profession to get back on their feet. As far as the reimbursement rates now, psychologically for me, I don't even, I don't worry about it from the standpoint of, I, I, I truthfully just feel like I'm just giving it away. It's what I owe Tacoma. They've, I've been here a long time, and they've truthfully made us a very successful practice. I'm very happy with where we're at. Um, it's not that big of an issue for me to do a little bit um, and me taking care of some of these people, you can tell it means a lot more for them that one hour I gave them than the one hour of production I might have lost taking care of them. I gotta admit, it's sort of nice to just park them in the chair, get them numb in the whole quad, 
work from one end to the other, get it done, feel like you're doing a great job, they're leaving decay free, and you're not worried about can they pay for it, or they're not worried about, you're not having to time things out and do things. You just do it because you're doing the dentistry. And, you know, dentistry's still fun. You know where we are, we have any issues, all right? Okay, man, you take care. Thank you, you too. Billing is slow. Well, the reality is claims are paid as fast as private insurance. In fact, many have experienced that when the billing is learned uh, through the system for the provider one system, it is done, when it is done properly, the payment happens in a matter of days, often even faster than with private insurance. So it may have been true years ago when the system first began, but today those who do it routinely will tell you that there are no issues of slow billing. It's very fast. You get paid very quickly from Apple Health. What about billing? Well, Medicaid pays quickly, as noted, and there's support for the staff. Provider One, which is the billing system implemented back in 2010, provides payment and faster, faster, as noted, than private insurance. The Healthcare Authority, the agency in our state which manages the Medicaid program, offers regular Apple Health Dental 101 trainings for staff in locations around the state. They're happy to come in and train your staff and their locations the staff can go. The Healthcare Authority wants the program to work and they want you to be to they want to facilitate your needs in taking Apple Health into your practice. So there are many opportunities to get billing underway and get the right training. Reality, Apple Health fees are low. Well, that is a reality. There's no myth. The fees are very low. We're all concerned about that, and this is the number one reason why many do not accept Apple Health into their practice, why many have not taken Medicaid into their practice historically. And it's totally understood. Um, we have struggled with having more patients on Apple Health than we could possibly manage, but it is essential that we all have a combined approach that we look at the problem in two parts that we work with the state work with dental society to increase the fees it's essential in the long term that we work on this and figure out ways maybe through limited procedures that are approved maybe focusing on prevention but reimburse at a higher rate there are many approaches that have been presented and discussed focus on patients with special health care needs Whatever the case may be, we do need to work on that. However, at the same time in parallel, it is our obligation, it is our duty to all do a small part so that collectively we can make a big difference. It gives us a stronger voice as a community, as a, as a dental community, as a dental profession, when we all are already doing our part, albeit small, but collectively large, to have a voice in changing access and continuing and sustaining the program. It's particularly important for the patients who are covered by Apple Health, maybe just on a temporal basis, but need our services desperately. This is one of the most demanding in, in, in terms of uh, need, uh, of oral health needs, and uh, we can do a great service for them. So yes, the fees are low. There's no doubt about it. And But if the chairs are empty, as mentioned, it is incremental revenue, and that's why it's important to look at starting small and looking at the opportunity where there can be incremental revenue that's not cannibalizing other revenue and where an office could sustain a certain number of patients per month. What about audits? You hear about audits and people are afraid of getting into Medicaid into Apple Health because audits will auditors will come in and you know you're trying to do the right thing and you're you're doing the good thing and they just come in and say, nope, you didn't do this right or didn't do that right, and you hear these stories. Well, first of all, audits are very rare. In the last five years, fewer than half a percent of all Washington Medicaid dental providers have been audited, 16 providers in total. Audits are data-driven. A code is examined for all dental providers identifying outliers, large numbers of certain procedures. Um, it's the same kind of things that would trigger uh, scrutiny from other third-party payers, in fact, where there is generally a higher level of scrutiny than with Apple Health. So it's no different than any payer. Um, with, through proper documentation and understanding the program, audits can be prevented or minimized. 
It's all about documentation. The most common reason for an audit or an audit finding certainly is insufficient documentation. If the documentation is done correctly, it's always true, then there shouldn't be any problem. Think like an auditor. If it's not documented, it probably didn't happen. So get the staff trained, work on the proper uh, documentation for each patient, and if we all take a few patients into our practice, we will make a tremendous difference in the hundreds of thousands of patients and the lives of these patients across the state who desperately need our services. And we can talk about expanding the program in terms of its reach, but more importantly through its fee increases that are absolutely necessary, but we will, as noted, have a stronger voice when we all have skin in the game by participating in the program, albeit with a few patients starting out per month, but collectively a very large number of patients going into getting services who desperately need these services. Okay, good. So, good, good news. Actually, the, um, the tooth we're putting the filling in. One of the ways I describe the new Apple Health population is that I see more folks who are in the working class more folks who are baristas, more folks who are construction workers who have needed the same kind of care but maybe haven't been able to afford it either on a long-term basis or a short-term basis. Regardless of one's income, if our health begins in our mouth, if we can take care of oral health, then we can prevent other sickness from coming down the line. As a child, I came from poverty. Uh, I hadn't seen a dentist till I was seven or eight years old. In fact, I wasn't even really sure what a dentist was until I was that age. And that's more common than people want to admit. Really, it's an opportunity to change some attitudes generationally that have been going on. So now, suddenly you have these parents that didn't have access to health care, have access to health care, and that behavior alone is something they can pass on to their children so they can change the way folks approach their dental health in the long run. It's really tough to get a job if you have poor oral health, and so if we can assure that people have sound care and that they have a presentable smile, then they can be employed and have that peace of mind of knowing that they're contributing to society and that they can take care of themselves. For those folks who are low income, where the margins are super tight and the opportunities are, are few, uh, good dental health could be the key for them to be successful. As the profile is raised on the importance of oral health in the legislature, we need our dentists to be our partners. And I know that there are issues around uh, reimbursement, but I think this uh, opportunity to serve those clients will be the opportunity that we'll have as legislators to then sit down and talk to them directly about ways that we can resolve that and resolve that quickly. You know, we talk about the overall cost of health care and kind of how that's been consistently on the rise. Getting these folks in early has helped uh, just uh, the state as a whole manage that cost and help to at least smooth it out, if not lower it. And I understand that dentists are small business owners. And as a legislator, I'm not asking them to take on all the Apple Health clients, but I'm just asking for them to take on a couple of or a few of them. And just those, everyone taking on a little bit helps uh, us serving all these folks. It's such a powerful thing to give someone the courage and the self-esteem that goes along with a great smile. And you never know. They may end up a senator or the president. Who knows? You know where we are, man. <laughs> yes, right? Okay, man. You take care. Thank you. You too. There are so many intrinsic benefits, the personal satisfaction and staff morale from serving patients who are in the most need of anyone. By providing treatment without regard for patients' ability to pay, there's no copay. And to improve the health, the oral health of the community. Oral health is a big part of total health and patients cannot be healthy. We are not healthy state if our mouths aren't healthy. And it is our obligation to be the educators, be the providers, and be the caregivers for everybody across the state. Patients are exceptionally appreciative. It's a win-win situation and as mentioned, many patients will be on Apple Health on a temporal basis, will have other means to pay and will be so grateful to your office. What a better, nothing better in terms of a practice builder than to help those in need for that time when they need our services. 
to get started, it'll involve the whole team, engage the community, uh, talk to your practice, look at your efficiencies and where you have gaps and schedule openings. Look, as mentioned before, and send your staff to an Apple Health training. Make it as smooth as possible. Start small, get bigger as needed, and make sure it's going to fit. And don't overdo it at first so you get burned out, but rather um, increase the number slowly. Apple Health patients are, like all of us, appreciative of the services, grateful for improving their health, for eliminating pain, and preventing disease. If you want to sign up, there's a website you can go. This is to be a provider for Apple Health, and the website is here. Or you can email or call at the number here on the screen to get your questions answered. The Healthcare Authority is here to help all of us improve the program, and we are the most important part, the dental professional team, all of us in the dental practice working together to improve the lives, to improve the oral health of citizens across the state of Washington.